Okay, I think we're ready to go. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Ali Baez. I direct the Iran project at the International Crisis Group. As you know, Crisis Group is an independent, international, non-governmental organization dedicated to saving lives through the prevention, mitigation, and resolution of deadly conflict. We do this through field research, writing detailed analytical reports, and then taking our recommendations to the leaders and influencers of all parties. We have about 120 staff around the world and we work on 55th, uh, com 55 conflicts and crises uh, around the world. Today, I'm very pleased that we're joined by a fantastic panel that needs no introduction, but I'll introduce them briefly anyways. We have our former trustee, General Wesley Clark, who served uh, um, in the US Army for 38 years and was commander of the US Southern Command and the European Command, and finally, a uh, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO in Europe. We have Megan O'Sullivan, who is a current trustee of the International Crisis Group uh, and a professor of the practice of international affairs at Harvard Kennedy School. She served as Deputy National Security Advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan during the Bush administration, uh, Vice Chair of All Party Talks uh, in Northern Ireland and Senior Director for Strategic Planning and Southwest Asia at the uh, National Security Council. Uh, and last but not least is Joost Tilterman, who is the director of the Middle East and North Africa program uh, at Crisis Group and has served this organization faithfully since 2002. Okay, let's delve right into the discussion. Uh, I think it's obvious that the COVID-19 crisis has done almost nothing to diminish tensions between Iran and the US, particularly in the Gulf. In fact, it might have exacerbated them. Since the beginning of the public health crisis, we've seen rocket attacks in Iraq. Uh, in March, uh, for instance, they killed uh, two Americans and uh, a British so soldier. Uh, we've seen a dangerous skirmish uh, in April when 11 IRGC Revolutionary Guards boats uh, came within 10 yards of US warships in the Gulf. Uh, Iran has also launched a military satellite two weeks ago uh, while the US is trying to kill whatever remains of the 2015 nuclear deal through preventing the lifting of the UN arms embargo on Iran in October. We at Crisis Group have been concerned for some time uh, that the US maximum pressure and Iranian maximum resistance strategies have created a dangerous situation in the Gulf and the wider region. Uh, even though neither the US nor Iran wants a full-fledged war, in the past year, dangerous tit-for-tat exchanges amid escalating hostile rhetoric have brought the two countries to the verge of a military confrontation three times. Uh, once after the shooting down of the US drone by the Iranians, second after the attack on Saudi Aramco, and third after the killing of General Soleimani uh, and Iranian retaliation in the form of missile attacks on US military installations in Iraq. Uh, and of course, all of this while the region uh, was hit by the fall in the global oil prices and the COVID-19 pandemic. To mitigate ten tensions and prevent conflict in the coming months, uh, we have been pursuing two complementary policy lines that focus on the need for new channels of, for communication. The first approach is focused on establishing a military-to-military -military hotline between Iran and the US. Now, you might ask, what's the need for this, given the fact that the Swiss embassy in Tehran, uh, which looks after US interests in Iran, uh, played a very effective role uh, as an intermediary during the fallout uh, from Soleimani killing back in January. Well, in case of an accidental interaction in the Persian Gulf uh, between the two sides' navies, the Swiss Channel would not be able to prevent that clash from quickly escalating into a broader confrontation. It can deal with its consequences, but it can't really uh, stop it and prevent it. Uh, there is also standard radio communication uh, known as bridge to bridge communication between the navies on both sides, but these are at low level uh, and they're all, they're all, therefore they're ins uh, insufficient for preventing escalation. And finally, there is Twitter, uh, but it does not require uh, great leaps of imagination uh, to see how using Twitter as a principal means of communication between Washington and Tehran might increase the risk of miscalculation and potential for what could be a catastrophic escalation. So after months of discussion, uh, discussions with uh, stakeholders on both sides as well as uh, in the region, we published a briefing uh, that proposes a clear, realistic innovation 
uh, to avert an accidental collision between uh, Washington and Tehran uh, in the Gulf. Uh, since both sides have designated uh, their respective militaries in the Gulf uh, as foreign terrorist organizations, uh, the channel will have to go through uh, a third party. Uh, and we recommended Oman as a perfect uh, candidate for this role as it is in charge of the exit traffic from the Strait of Hormoz uh, and has military agreements with both uh, uh, US and Iran and a history of mediation uh, between the two countries. The second approach is based on a longer term need for an inclusive regional dialogue uh, between the main actors in the Gulf, meaning Saudi Arabia and the five members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, as well as Iran and Iraq, backed by European and other governments. To generate political will to get the parties to the table, the worst of times uh, might offer uh, the best of uh, opportunities and conditions in the Gulf arguably uh, have reached that point. In fact, some Gulf states like the UAE uh, use the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity to de-escalate tensions by providing and facilitating uh, humanitarian assistance to Iran. To discuss all of this, it's, uh, I'll first turn to uh, General Clark, who will share with us his views uh, on the military risks in the Gulf uh, and the indirect hotline proposal. Uh, then we'll go to Professor O'Sullivan, who will discuss the overall energy situation in the region. Uh, and we'll end with Dr. Hilterman, who will talk to us about the prospects uh, of, uh, uh, for regional dialogue. In the meantime, feel free to uh, write your questions using the Q&A tab. I'll be putting them uh, to the speakers after their uh, presentations. Uh, Wes, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ali. It's uh, great to be back with the International Crisis Group, and <clears throat> thanks for the innovative work that you're doing. So, um, as most of us know, we've been in a 40-year conflict with Iran, we, the United States. It's gone on and on, and incident after incident. Um, and uh, we've assisted Iran's opponents. They called us the great Satan. They truck bombed our embassy and, uh, and our, our, our Marines, rather, in Beirut in 1983, killed uh, over 250 U.S. Marines. Um, they struck at Kobar Towers. We mistakenly shot down an uh, a, a Iranian uh, passenger aircraft in, in the 1980s. It goes on and on and on. The Obama administration thought they could... Uh, make a strategic uh, uh, breakthrough by uh, working with uh, the others to create the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, but we're, uh, that, that, that's, uh, at least as far as the United States is concerned now, that we, we've moved out of that. The United States doesn't feel that's adequate. So as the United States undergoes a maximum, puts a maximum pressure campaign against Iran, Iran has looked for a way to, to retaliate, to, to push back. And it went to the military channel. And, um, and uh, with the assassination of al Soleimani in January, uh, the United States has made clear there are limits that, can, that Iran must comply with. Now, these latest incidents show um, an Iranian effort to sort of push up against the line, to, to struggle back against the maximum campaign, pressure campaign. But it's actually not in the interest of either country to escalate to open warfare. It's not in the Iranian interest because they would lose conclusively. It's not in the American interest because after the first wave of strikes and so forth, what are you gonna do with Iran? You're gonna make it a failed state and, and even greater problems. So we know there has to be a diplomatic solution for this somehow. And to get to that, we need to reduce the military tensions or at least keep them under control so the fighting doesn't escalate. So the bridge-to-bridge -bridge communications that Ali was talking about are important. They're essential, but they're not sufficient. And if you try to do it at the national level, it gets all caught up in politics. So I think ICG has wisely, wisely recommended, and, and I certainly agree with it, is you need some stepped up channel of communications. Let's say a flag officer, a one star, or maybe a full colonel in the headquarters of the United States Central Command connect, connected to the operations cell. And he would go through a military counterpart in Oman who has communications with an Iranian of equivalent stature, someone who can reach up into the National Command Authority, but someone who is below the level at which every statement is political and every question is political. So you try to keep it at the military level. You try to be able to diffuse incidents before they get out of control. And, um, and this, through this brokered um, 
set of communications, I think it's the only feasible way to work. Uh, I've been in the Gulf. I've talked to Iranian diplomats back in, uh, in the aughts. Um, and uh, of course, they're always, um, they're very uh, educated. They're very capable. Uh, but when you get down to the military level, uh, people are very sensitive. Uh, and I'm sure the Iranian military is. And so the direct communications probably is not the way to go. You would have to go brokered. And Oman seems to be the right source. So, Ali, I think ICG has a very good approach on this. And uh, I hope we'll persuade the government of o Oman to accept this and, uh, and let them deal with the Iranians on it. I think it's clearly in, in Iran's interest to have this channel. And it is in interest, too. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Wes. Um, Megan, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Ali, and thank you for organizing uh, this, this call meeting this morning. It's an honor to be a trustee of the International Crisis Group and uh, a pleasure to be speaking with you all today and with my esteemed colleagues. As you mentioned, I'm going to say a few words about the energy situation and how it impacts the Middle East in particular. Um, as people will be well aware, simultaneous to the COVID-19 crisis, there has been a historic collapse in oil markets. Really, we've seen um, a collapse that's been unprecedented in the history of, of oil. Um, we've seen prices go down by two thirds since the beginning of the year. And this has obviously put enormous strains on both countries and on companies. So what I'd like to do just briefly is say, make two points about the crisis in the oil markets overall, and then spend a few minutes talking about the economic and geopolitical implications for the Middle East. So first, um, just a few words about the cause of the oil collapse, the oil market collapse. There's been a lot of attention given to the, um, the spat between Saudi and Russia that unfolded in the beginning of March. You basically saw um, the Saudis ask the Russians and other members of OPEC and OPEC plus. So those are countries that are not formally part of OPEC, but have been cooperating with OPEC for the last several years. Um, the Saudis proposed an additional cut in production in order to address the declining demand that we were already seeing mostly from China at that point, declining oil demand. The Russians said no, they weren't interested in doing that. And what happened was we saw a big supply surge from the Saudis and also promise from other actors as well. So this is kind of in the middle of March. Um, now, a lot of attention, particularly among US politicians, has been placed on that supply surge and on the Saudi responsibility for that happening. But I think a key thing for us to appreciate is that supply surge was in the context of a much, much greater demand shock, a drop in demand. So the collapse in the oil market um, had a little bit to do the supply surge that the Saudis initiated and the Russians and others pledged to follow. But it had much, much more to do with the drop in demand that we're seeing from essentially the immobilization of more than half of the world's economy. So just to give you some numbers, um, the world for April, uh, the numbers aren't in yet, final numbers aren't in, but people anticipate that demand for oil dropped by 30 million barrels of oil a day, somewhere around that, which is about a third of global demand. Um, and keep in mind, this is the context of a commodity where pretty much every year, with a couple of exceptions, demand has grown. So instead, we've seen a collapse of demand by a third. So 30 million barrels of oil no longer demanded by the global economy in the context of maybe about two, two and a half additional barrels of oil being put on the market by the Saudis. So even if the Saudis and the Russians hadn't had this oil spat, we would still be having a massive crisis in oil markets. That's the first point. The second point on the overall oil crisis is the response. So we saw in mid-April, on April 12th, an agreement of OPEC and OPEC plus, most significantly Russia, coming back together after this month of kind of um, fighting for market share, kind of putting more oil on the market. We saw them come together in April and make 
uh, a pledge for, again, a historic cut in production, that basically these countries said collectively they're going to cut 10 million barrels of oil a day of production. That's, again, about a tenth of what the world was consuming before the COVID-19 crisis. They're going to cut production by that m amount, and the hope is that that is going to help restore balance in the oil market. This, I'd just like to point out, um, this effort was un also unprecedented because you not only had OPEC, you had OPEC plus, but you also had for the first time really the President of the United States getting very intimately involved in these negotiations. So President Trump was, people were calling him OPEC's greatest negotiator. He was calling the Russians, calling the Saudis, bringing them to the table. He was um, integral in actually getting Mexico to come on board the agreement or finding a compromise that allowed the agreement to go forward even though Mexico wouldn't agree uh, to taking its production cut in its entirety. So you also had the G20 deeply involved with encouraging this, calling for it. And there was an active debate in the United States about whether the US should find some ways to make its own production cut. That didn't happen, mostly in it because the US is um, actually taking a big production cut because of market forces, not government action, where you have uh, the American industry being hurt severely by this crisis as well. So the last point I'd make just on this response, that it was actually, I would say, one, it was um, a demonstration of how the world can come together in unprecedented ways to deal with a crisis as deep as the one we're seeing. But two, um, I think that it has this response by OPEC plus um, has been regarded as not um, being particularly effective or significant because it's actually after that agreement that we saw prices in the US go below zero um, and we still see incredibly low oil prices. What I would say is that we should have never looked at that agreement as being um, its effectiveness as bolstering prices, that's what we're used to seeing, but really the importance of that agreement is kind of beginning to close the gap between supply and demand, and that its effectiveness, it's a two-year agreement, its effectiveness will kind of become more evident over time as the global economy starts to come back, as demand starts to come back, and we see the, the supply being constrained by this OPEC plus agreement, that that will be helpful. So I think it's too early to say this agreement was a failure. Let me say a few words about what this means for the Middle East. Um, first, I'll say about economic implications and then a few geopolitical implications. These are big topics, which I look forward um, to talking about if people have any questions. First, on the economic side, obviously this is crushing for a lot of Middle Eastern economies that are big producers of oil. So from Algeria to Iraq, in the immediate term, we see major financial and fiscal crises. I think Iraq is the most urgent um, and, the, and the most evident, most, I would say, pressing in a, a variety of ways, but Iraq is sort of emblematic of other um, major oil producing countries and countries that rely primarily on oil revenues to fund their budget. So in Iraq's case, 90% of the governor, government revenue, sometimes a little bit more, is funded by um, oil revenues. And those oil revenues have dropped to a 10 year low just in the last month or so. So the Iraqi government did their budget for this year, focused on $56 barrel of oil. Uh, for Brent, the price is now down at about 28. It's been lower, um, but obviously there's a huge gap. And so the Iraqis, given that they have a very bloated public sector, like many other countries in the Middle East, they're trying to figure out just how to pay people, forget about how to allocate spending among health sectors, um, education, security. So this is a, an urgent, and I would say even existential financial crisis for the Iraqis and others in the region um, that have similar dependencies. And particularly in, in Iraq, what's notable is this is in the context of other crises, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, in the medium term, we have other big producers that are going to um, suffer some economic uh, burdens, uh, potentially large ones over time, but they're much better positioned to manage them. I think about Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Kuwait, um, you know, many of these countries, Saudi in particular, are definitely going to have to rely a lot more on debt um, and that they're really having to look at their economic plans and reassess them in pretty dramatic ways. Um, because again, a country like Saudi Arabia was counting on, or their, their budget was basically figured that 
it, it could break even when pri the price of oil was $83 a barrel. Again, we're down at 28. So major gaps, major deficits, but ones that countries like Saudi Arabia can at least manage for the medium term. So this raises a question about what is what is the implications for these countries over the long term? Is this just a case where they need to survive a few months and then they can look forward to things returning to a more healthy price environment? And I would say that depends on, on two things which are very much up, up in the air. First is the question of how quickly demand for oil returns. Um, there are different projections depending on whom you speak with. The um, Energy Information Agency in the United States anticipates that demand for oil could be back at 2019 levels by the end of 2020. I personally think that is extremely optimistic because we think about 65% of the world's oil is used for transportation and it's very hard to imagine, at least I find it hard to imagine, that international air traffic will be back uh, at regular levels at the end of this year. Um, also, you know, just even in terms of people's mobility, big questions within countries. So there's a very, very active debate about how long it's going to take for demand to return to December 2019 levels. And I think maybe if there's any kind of middle ground on this debate, it's saying this is going to be at least a year. So this is going to be a long time before demand comes back. And it's going to be in the context of huge oil inventories that have built up over, over time that the demand will need to eat into it. So we're looking at a low price environment for a while. There is a scenario, of course, where demand moves faster than supply and we could get actually higher oil prices that could benefit some of these uh, economies, but I don't think that's in the immediate term. The second thing I'll just say a word about, it's a big topic, is the extent to which, um, the, the, how long this will last and the implications for the Middle East depends a lot on the extent to which governments, which are enacting huge stimulus, stimulus packages, the extent to which those governments actually take this moment as an opportunity to push the energy transition faster than it would otherwise go. There's certainly the opportunity to do that. We don't yet know if there's going to be the political will. Just geopolitically, and I'll be very quick here to have time to, to move to Yoast. Um, geopolitically, I think it's pretty evident to all of us on this call that one, uh, we should expect a big increase in the fragility of many of the important states in the Middle East, that this will have security implications. It certainly will have implications for things like the fight against ISIS. Um, the second geopolitical thing I would mention is this, I think, is going to end up being an episode which is very tough on the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Um, even though the Saudis did come forward, they did orchestrate this significant cut. I think a lot of the nuances of the situation have um, not been fully appreciated by um, political actors in Washington, and that many look at this as an example of that the Saudis are responsible for this and their actions were insufficient. And so I think we might see um, an even less favorable congressional environment for the Saudis than we were seeing before the COVID-19 crisis. And then lastly, I would mention um, this crisis, I think, will have longer term implications for Russia's role in the Middle East. Russia not only had um, used the last several years to build a closer uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia and other countries over oil market uh, collaboration, but Russia had used this entree into oil markets to really expand its influence geopolitically, politically, diplomatically, uh, economically, investment in other ways. And so I think that Russia, by really being, I, I would say, the initiator of this spat I spoke about at the beginning, um, really, uh, I think, raise some question marks in the minds of Russia's Middle Eastern partners about just how reliable a partner uh, Russia is, how strategic a partner Russia is, or whether Russia is more transactional and opportunistic in the region. So I think we, we could see some changes in that relationship as well, which will have larger geopolitical consequences. Um, a lot to talk about, but I'll stop there and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Megan. That was fascinating and a very comprehensive overview uh, of the current situation in the energy markets. Uh, Joost, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ali, and I'm um, uh, very pleased to be on the panel with uh, Megan and Wes. So, and thank you all for joining. Uh, it's a great turnout, and um, I hope you find this uh, little exercise, the first one uh, of this kind that I, I, Crisis Group has organized. I hope you find it uh, useful. So uh, following up on uh, Ali's um, uh, starting point, uh, that our crisis group is pursuing two different uh, ways in terms of 
trying to bring down bring down the tensions in the in the Gulf between the United States and Iran in particular. He mentioned the, the hotline and West talked about some of the military aspects of that. Um, and then he mentioned the, the need for a, a broader uh, cooperative, inclusive dialogue. So we've just uh, published a report on that as well. And I, so I won't worry by, by uh, summarizing it. It's out there uh, on the web, you'll find it. Um, but i give you a little bit of background and then answer a couple of difficult questions that the report raises. Um, so, so first of all, the, the, the report is, uh, it comes up with an idea that is not ours, that is an old idea. And in fact, uh, I know that some of you in the audience have worked on this issue for a long time, um, colleagues at CIPRI, for example, in Stockholm and others. So um, it's an old idea, but we, we think it's an idea that whose time has come. Um, uh, previously, the idea was there. We've always understood the need for uh, greater uh, uh, cooperation across the Gulf. Uh, not simply by the Arab Gulf states, but uh, also including Iran. Um, but um, the political will never existed, um, and arguably it requires a real crisis before political will uh, emerges, or has a chance to emerge. And, and I would argue that, in fact, we have reached that, that moment. Um, so, so it's, a, it's an alternate idea whose time has come, uh, and a lot of the groundwork has already been laid in terms of intellectually, in terms of what is would be would what would be required, what kind of steps uh, governments would need to take in order to to take this further. There have already been a number of track two dialogue exercises that have um, uh, covered this, including uh, people from from all countries in the region. In fact, the, the greater Middle East, not just in the Gulf. Um, and um, but we need to bring this to a track one level. So that is what we are talking about. Now we uh, when we started this effort was exactly a year ago. I gave a presentation to the to the UN Security Council uh, back in February of last year, and then we had a, a meeting at the um, at our office in New York, with uh, where we invited uh, uh, diplomats from the various missions. Uh, to the UN, uh, mostly from the Middle East, uh, some from Europe and other countries as well, came and we had an open discussion um, and we had an expert, Mike Morgan, uh, who's an academic in North Carolina, who um, presented his uh, book, a new book on the, the CSE process that led to the Helsinki Accords. And it was very interesting. We, and then we put out a white paper and we essentially road tested this idea with governments. We had a lot of uh, feedback, which we then plowed into the report that we published last week. Um, and so our main argument is that uh, we, we cannot afford uh, not to try to uh, bring together countries in the region, uh, in the sub-region in the Gulf, with external backing uh, to have some kind of inclusive dialogue that focuses on security issues, the most pressing security issues. Um, that, that the, the need for it is clear. The question is, how do you do it? And, and uh, who would need to participate from the outside? So the two main difficult questions I want to lay on the table um, that of course we, we address in the report to some extent, but that I'm sure um, will exercise everyone is first of all, you know, where does the United States stand in this? How could we even imagine that US allies in the Gulf, such as Saudi Arabia and the UAE, would engage in, an, in a dialogue with Iran as long as the United States is pursuing a maximum pressure policy, uh, which does not allow for any kind of deviation from that line from its allies in the Gulf uh, through dialogue with Iran. And secondly, um, well, it's fine to have a dialogue between Iran and the Arab Gulf states, but the real conflict is between Iran and the United States. So shouldn't there be a dialogue between them? Um, so what and what is the point then of having a, a Gulf-based uh, security dialogue? So very briefly on each one of these two. So first of all, in terms of um, the U.S., the, the American role, we we understand very well. First of all, that uh, we're not going to get any dialogue started in the next few months, uh, and probably not under this administration. And who knows if uh, President Trump wins re-election, then maybe not under the next administration either. But this kind of dialogue exercise is not a short-term thing. It is a multi-year event, as was the CSCE process back in the 1970s, which started actually even before then, uh, but an all earnestness in 1972 or so, and then took three years before reaching its concrete results. 
So we understand these, that these things take time. Um, and so there is no problem to start laying the diplomatic groundwork now by governments that are interested in doing so. And if we look back at the Helsinki process, we see that that effort was initiated. It was originally a Soviet idea, by the way, but it was initiated by two relatively neutral European countries, Finland and Switzerland. Um, it wasn't initiated by Britain or France or Germany. They supported it. Uh, in fact, all of Europe supported it, Canada also, and the United States supported it, but they were not the initiators. And we could imagine a similar setup uh, in the Gulf. But in this case, uh, if the smaller Gulf states, for example, were to take such an initiative, they would need to have external backing. And that external backing would have to include the United States. And again, today, that's inconceivable. But let's say that uh, there will be a new administration uh, after November or after January of 2021. Um, and then um, it is possible to imagine uh, US support for a dialogue between Iran and the, the Arab Gulf states and Iraq. Um, and in fact, it might not be um, a bad idea to overcome some of the resistance within the Congress both towards um, uh, to talking with Iran, because there is obviously uh, a long history uh, for, the, for decades, as we, as we heard from Wes, of, of bad relations, bad blood there, but also the increasingly bad relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. And maybe to encourage this kind of dialogue in the Gulf is something that uh, people in Congress might support, um, because uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily invest the United States overly, um, but would also um, uh, ask of uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran to show good faith in this effort uh, as something, uh, as a way to bring uh, a degree of stability to the region, which is a U.S. interest. So my view is we may not get the United States now, but we can get it later, hopefully. We certainly should not exclude that possibility. And until then, there is plenty of work to be done. Let's start now. We may fail, we probably will fail, but we cannot afford not to try because the situation is so dangerous. Secondly, why uh, a Gulf-based effort and not a US-Iran one? Well, again, US-Iran at the moment is, is inconceivable. Maximum pressure, maximum resistance, Ali mentioned it. Uh, we, think, we think that it is more likely that the Gulf states will walk, want to talk to each other, especially the smaller ones, and Ali already mentioned the gesture that the UAE made toward Iran uh, during the, the COVID-19, the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. Oman, Kuwait, Qatar also made similar gestures toward Iran at the time. Um, so, so they understand very well how exposed they are, how vulnerable to uh, any um, uh, attack on them should there be a, a direct war between the United States uh, and Iran. And I think Saudi Arabia is on the same page, but um, it's going to take more time for, for, the, for the Saudis. In any case, um, uh, we do think that if we can get a, a dialogue started, even at the beginning of a new US administration, um, that in itself could have a positive impact on how the United States views such a dialogue and might bring the United States in. Now, again, we're not working here without precedent. During the CSEE process, the United States was on board in supporting the European countries in this process uh, during the three years. But uh, Henry Kissinger, who was at the time dual headed as Foreign Secretary, Secretary of State, I'm sorry, and um, uh, National Security Advisor, was actually not in support of it. And at times actively undermined it by going directly to, uh, to Brezhnev, and uh, who were more focused on international arms control. But in the end, close to the signing of the Accords, it was Kissinger who came around and whose role then was critical in these accords uh, being signed. So the United States role in the end was instrumental in bringing this to a positive conclusion. So I think I leave it there. Um, I think uh, European governments in particular, but also maybe some governments in Asia who have a stake in what is going on in the Gulf, who have a stake in the Gulf, not uh, devolving, descending into chaos, um, can start to lay the groundwork. Uh, and uh, this is the moment to, to start talking about that and perhaps to start some, to form some kind of core group that would take uh, the lead on this. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joost.
before I go to the list of Q&As that we've received, and there are actually very good questions in there, I want to give the floor uh, for uh, two or three minutes to uh, Oman's ambassador to the United Nations who has joined us. Uh, ambassador Hassan, I'm just going to open up your microphone. Uh, let's see if we can hear you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. It's so good to see General Clark, uh, to see uh, Ms. O'Sullivan and uh, Mr. Hiltimer. Uh, certainly, there is a there is a, a crisis of mistrust between the United Nations, between the United States and Iran. This is not a, a revelation, but this is a fact. And what happened after the GCPO agreement and the withdrawal of the United States from that agreement, it really changed the uh, chemistry and the reaction of the Iranians. My question is, about a week ago, I participated in a, in a, in a conference, a meeting, virtual meeting, uh, which was hosted by the uh, Center for U.S. Diplomacy at Yale University, which was conducted by the former Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry. And he referred to the fact that the increasing role, particularly trade, of China and Russia in the Middle East, and in particularly, most particularly, in the Gulf, is due to the uh, reduced role and the back vacancy left by the United States in the region. And also by the US policy when it comes to the Palestinian question, when it comes to Yemen, when it comes to other issues. Now, going through the big picture, you know, with this China and the United States, how do you see the US role in the Middle East? Do you see a more engagement, of course, in the, uh, in the after the elections <laughs> here in the United States? Do you see a more engaged uh, U.S. role in the Middle East back to the same assertiveness they used to have? Having said that, we, the Omanis, probably very familiar with the Iranians. And, but we don't really like to brag about it. But also, when it comes to any diplomatic role to, uh, to take place between the U.S and Iran. I believe at this moment it is very difficult, but at the same time, it's not impossible. But other parties also have to send positive messages to the Iranians. Some of the messages in terms of the sanctions, in terms of the COVID-19 trying, you know, these sanctions that are in place, sometimes it does prevent the Iranians even from getting some of the very basic things. Yes, I hear what has been said about the launching of, of a rocket by the Iranians about two weeks back, but also there is a humanitarian aspect. There is some CPMs that we talk about, and that is very important for such messages to take place, not only from the United States, but also from other allies, particularly the Europeans, the EU. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I want to turn this question to Wes first and then see if uh, Megan and Joost also want to um, contribute something. Uh, but Wes, uh, uh, if you could answer the Ambassador's question in terms of whether this crisis would uh, uh, turn the US into a more inward looking uh, power. Uh, there were also some questions from the audience uh, that whether this would uh, be an opportunity maybe to, to wag the dog and deflect attention from the administration's failures at home to uh, contain this crisis. Uh, you're muted, Wes. Yep. Thank you. I don't. I, I think it's a huge opportunity for the United States to demonstrate global leadership, and um, I think there are many different aspects of this that could be put in play. Uh, and I hope the United States will not turn inward. But um, the United States right now seems to be uh, caught in, in a bind. It, it, it wants the peace agreement in Israel to be accepted. It needs Saudi support. The Saudis are hostile to the Iranians. And any move that is made in that direction by the other states is resisted by the United States because of the relationship with Saudi Arabia. 
So that's why we're supporting Saudi actions in Yemen and so forth. It's a very difficult conundrum for the United States. And, um, and I hope uh, that the United States can see past this and see that it has a broader global role. Uh, I take the ambassador's uh, point about China coming in. And, uh, and of course, China is going to come in. China is uh, dependent on oil resources from the region anyway. China has always sought a larger global role. And when the United States uh, uh, reduces its presence and reduces its influence more broadly in the region, it provides an opening for China to come in. So um, as, um, as you said, a lot depends on the U.S. election. But I think uh, even before uh, the U.S. election, I think it's possible to push for this military channel. I think that's something that uh, the United States uh, Armed Forces would recommend as, uh, to the president and to the National Security Council, something that's just common sense. Because um, uh, it, it is a way of making sure that any military action serves a political purpose. And, and not just uh, is a reflex in self-defense. Now, President Trump's been very clear. He expects a uh, forceful response to any further Iranian provocations. And that's fine. But uh, there's always the risk of escalation in this. And that escalation has, could have unintended consequences for the United States and for our friends and allies in the region. So I think the, the near-term way to move toward a broader U.S. engagement in the region is through this military uh, communications channel. It's a small step, but it's an important step at this point in the uh, election process. Excellent. Megan, please. Sure. Um, just to, to build on, on those comments, and I agree with General Wet, uh, Wes Clark about this, but um, first I would say that there is going to be, I think, a strong pull in the United States and in other countries um, to rebuild their own economies. I think that that is definitely going to be a new and very real dynamic. So I think that there will be more competition for America's interests with its own domestic interests. So, um, and you also see that just in the last couple of months, uh, unprecedented spending over $3 trillion. So this is gonna result in a very large deficit and this will become part of the the domestic conversation in the united states so i think there there is going to be a tendency to look at america first um, in that context that said i think um this this crisis this the covid 19 crisis underscores the global nature of so many of the challenges being faced not just by america but by every other country so hopefully um, we will have people consistently making that case. And if I could narrow it down to the Middle East and tie it back to my uh, comments about oil markets, I think one thing that um, people in the Middle East could take some satisfaction in, or at least note, is that this particular crisis demonstrated that despite having a huge amounts of its own oil production, America's interests in energy markets are still very closely tied to what happens in the Middle East. So there've been a lot of conversations, certainly um, the Trump administration has talked about energy dominance. That's been kind of the theme of its energy policy. And the implication was that the United States didn't need the Middle East because it had its own oil. Um, now this, I think, was never the case because as long as America is connected to global energy markets, our interests are closely tied to those of the Middle East, regardless of whether or not we're consuming a lot of Middle Eastern oil. But I think this particular crisis, which has been pretty, um, uh, I, I think it, it looks pretty devastating right now to the U.S. oil markets. I think they're, the oil, oil industry, I think it's going to come out um, reasonably okay for most players. But I think the point has been made that the U.S. and the Middle East are still closely tied together, a whole range of interests, but including energy, which is one that people had really come to dismiss earlier. Fantastic. Um, Joost, do you want to add anything or should I go to the Q&A? Very briefly, I just say, first of all, as a Dutchman and as a European, of course, I have strong views about American foreign policy, so I should say something. But um, I want to um, challenge maybe the premise of the question a little bit. I'm not sure that the United States' role in the region has, has been reduced. Um, yes, even under the Obama administration, certainly under the Trump administration, the United States is less eager to be fully deployed in the Middle East the way it used to be under previous administrations. 
Um, so, so in that sense, there is yes a reduced role, but otherwise, the United States today is still very much active in in, in the region. The problem is really its unpredictability. It's a, the erratic nature of its presence there. And I would hope that uh, a new administration would at least have a consistent policy that everybody can uh, sort of, uh, whether they agree with it or disagree, they, at least they can, they can work with it. At the moment, everybody's on tensor hooks because they don't really know what may happen next. Excellent. So um, I'll go through a series of questions. I uh, try to um, uh, tell you which uh, which one relates to uh, each of you, uh, and then I'll come back to you to uh, for for the answers. Uh, Professor Paul Sullivan of Johns Hopkins uh, is asking uh, whether Iran's completion of its new port at Josk uh, would allow it to go uh, outside of uh, the Hormuz Strait. Is that going to change anything? Is, is that going to have any impact on strategic calculations? And if Megan, uh, I can add this to the question as well, that whether in this market and your projection also for the next few months, uh, the, the carrot of providing Iran with sanctions relief, either by Trump 2.0 or President Biden, uh, has lost its, uh, its value. Um, because Iran will just simply not be able to regain its market share under the current circumstances, or, or that's not true and it still would be able to benefit. Uh, Nick Pelham from uh, The Economist is asking about uh, the recent statement by the Supreme Leader of Iran about um, uh, uh, the three disputed islands in, in the Persian Gulf um, and, and plans to settle Iranians uh, there, and whether this is uh, just a bluster or, uh, or or it's a serious uh, policy change. Uh, just uh, if you want to address that and I can also add uh, to it. Um, uh, the other question is uh, from Nikolai Surkov uh, to General Clark. Uh, what are the tactics that the Iranians might use to increase uh, pressure on the US and its allies uh, in the region? Uh, are they capable of another major uh, strike against oil installations uh, uh, in, in the region? And I guess by that he means Saudi Arabia. Uh, Ahmed al Mokheni from uh, Oman is asking whether uh, it is evident that the U.S. administration um, uh, has a, a lot of success on any interaction or arrangement involving Iran. Uh, um, what guarantees could we present to sustain any form of communication or even cooperation involving Iran should Trump win a second term? And there are several questions about the second uh, uh, Trump uh, ter term and its implications on everything that we've uh, discussed. Um, okay, and finally, uh, if... Um, uh, there's a question about uh, uh, China by uh, Pierre Razou from uh, France. Uh, don't you think that China is going to improve its position in the Gulf and the Middle East uh, far more than Russia? Um, and let me add actually one more to that, which is Walter Poche's uh, question that just goes to you, to you uh, which is that if you look at the CSCE uh, process, uh, the U.S. and USSR uh, were basically on equal footing. Uh, you don't have the same situation between Iran and the US, uh, and how does that affect uh, the uh, uh, solution that you're putting on the table? Um, so uh, I suggest we start uh, from uh, the end this time around with Yost, and then go back uh, to Megan and General Clark. Yost? Thanks, Ali. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, to start with the China and Russia, I think uh, um, uh, Pierre's question, I think the, um, uh, when we, I talked also about the US role, um, the, the reason that the United States continues to be involved in the Middle East erratically today, hopefully not erratically tomorrow, is also because China, while it is stepping up its trade relations, uh, and, and making the Middle East part of its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, at the same time, it has shown no inclination until now to take any kind of political role. And uh, I think there will be a turning point at some point in the future. When that comes, I have no idea. But sooner or later, China will want to parlay its economic influence into political influence as well. But until now, it has uh, shown no uh, tendency. Um, and so the United States, by default, will continue to play an important role, if only as a spoiler. And we already see that in Syria, for example, maybe in Iraq in the future. So 
Um, uh, but Russia, on the other hand, I think um, will certainly not play the kind of role that China could potentially play. Uh, Russia's role has been overstated, I think, in many cases. Um, Russia, of course, plays a critical role in Syria, but beyond that, it's barely present, bit in, in Libya, but that's about it. And, um, and it, it simply doesn't have uh, the size of the economy to, to play that kind of role. And now with the COVID-19, all bets are off anyway. So that um, briefly on, on China and Russia. The, uh, the three islands, I don't know if it's plus or not, uh, Nick, but um, I imagine it is because this is a long-standing issue and it's gone, you know, the, the, the rhetoric is flown back and forth. Um, if, if there were a real opportunity for either side, in this case Iran, if they're making these statements, uh, to move and to uh, take control, um, sure, they would do it, but um, I, I don't really see it under the current circumstances. I don't think the United States would stand for that militarily, um, and it would just become one more flashpoint that uh, might might escalate out of control. Hopefully, it will not go that way. Finally, on the CSE, Walter's question, uh, thanks for that. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, this was the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, and um, but the initiative, uh, while again the idea was came came from came from Khrushchev originally, then Brezhnev turned it into something else, and he presented it, and he made the strongest demand for it. Um, it was really something that the Europeans wanted because they didn't want a divided Europe. It was the Berlin Wall that made the, that, that created this problem that that both East and Western European countries wanted to overcome. They were the main engines of this effort. Now, in the Gulf, um, you have Iran and Saudi Arabia. They are the regional superpowers. They're very different. Iran uh, um, takes care of its own uh, self-defense. Saudis buy it off the shelf from the United States, but both are very militarily very powerful. Um, and um, so it's not, it's not the same. But there are external powers that could balance things out. And Iran is not without its friends. Uh, Russia is there, China is there pro probably, and Saudi Arabia has the United States behind it. So um, th there are similarities, there are also differences and we, you know, every situation is unique and we'll have to deal with the situation as it presents itself today. Great, thank you, Joost. Megan? Great. Uh, thanks for those questions. And I'll just say that I agree with Joost's analysis entirely on China and Russia and the relative roles that they'll play going forward. Um, so two questions related to Iran and to energy. The, the, the first um, having to do with the possibility of, of uh, Iran using a new port um, outside of the channel of the Straits of Hormuz, is if, if that would have any strategic significance. Uh, without knowing much about the capacity of the port or anything along those lines, I would simply say that on the one hand, yes, you could see that it might make Iran's threats to close the Straits of Hormuz um, even a little bit more viable because in the past when people have analyzed those threats, they've always acknowledged, well, this this would um, harm Iran as much as it would har harm other producers in the Middle East. Um, however, I, I think that 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 threat in, has, has generally been overblown in terms of how consequential it would be. Um, so I would say of the arsenal of tools that Iran might have geopolitically, that I, I'm not saying this is gonna change the strategic balance in any specific way. Um, Ali, on your, your good question about sanctions relief in this new oil market environment, um, is sanctions relief attractive? to um, the Iranians in, in any real sense. And I'd say um, in, implicit in your question, you know, yes, it, it's less attractive in the sense it would mean a less immediate infusion of cash into the Iranian economy, which I think is really necessary from the perspective of the Iranians. The combination of the price being so low and um, as you pointed out, the difficulty in muscling back into markets that are vastly oversupplied. So um, in this context, you, you, there's just so much more oil out there than people want to consume. And so I think it could be difficult for Iran, although it does have some relationships, particularly with China, that it could, it could employ. So I'd say on the one hand, um, that does make it less attractive. On the other hand, there are other parts of sanctions relief um, that don't 
relate just to the export of oil that could be attractive. Um, you know, I think it's probably a very difficult investment it, uh, climate for Iran to attract investment. Um, but certainly, you know, anything that would help them on that front, anything that could increase financial flows to Iran would be seen as valuable. Um, I also think that it would have an important implication in terms of just uh, a signpost into where this is going and whether talks at any point in time are going to actually be a viable way ahead or not. So I think sanctions relief still would be significant, um, but less so uh, in terms of the financial flows as you intimated. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Wes? Uh, you're muted. In terms of threats, I think the Supreme Leader's threat to settle these disputed islands is a brilliant ploy, uh, and it has to be looked at as one more pushback against the maximum pressure campaign because it puts uh, human beings out there and, uh, and invites someone to attack presumably unarmed or maybe lightly defended human beings that are just trying to have a better place to live. So it's a clever response to this. There are military options also. Um, so Iran has made good progress with its drones. So overflights by drones, harassment overflights by drones, uh, action by armed drones against uh, small boats and patrols uh, is, uh, is one way. Uh, intelligent or smart minds is another. So you can anchor in the seabed uh, mines, you can control them remotely, or they can be magnetically activated upon command or upon command. So they could target particular vessels, they could target uh, a near miss to a vessel, they could send a warning out, uh, as, and you can use the boats again. And, and the boats are uh, out there, they, okay, they don't come within 10 feet this time, they come within 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet. Uh, but they're out there showing a presence. Iran is going to use all of these things to push back. What the United States could do, if it wants to show real leadership, is find a way to come in and offer humanitarian assistance and land it in U.S. Air Force airplanes and get it distributed on the ground and market with, from the United States and make a big publicity play over this. To do that, we got to get our own act together in the United States at home. But I will say this, Ollie, just to, to finish in terms of U.S. global leadership, there's like 500 different companies in the United States with therapeutics or vaccines on the way. And we're getting very close um, to um, some of the vaccines are being injected, others are being produced, therapeutics are in trials and so forth. Um, and we've got an enormous medical advantage over the whole world in the United States economy. This is a time to use that if we want to see a greater global role and a greater show of global responsible leadership by the United States. Fantastic, thank you very much, uh, Wes. Uh, I just, uh, just want to put uh, Professor Peter John from Ottawa's um, uh, comment to you, and if you could give us a one minute answer, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, he, he says, uh, is the CSC OSC experience the only relevant one as possible inspiration model? I have found that many regional people view the ASEAN experience and others like SAARC uh, as also having valuable ideas and lessons. In the end, as many Middle Eastern systems will have to be sui generis as each region is unique. I would be interested in Yosa's response. Yeah, Peter, thanks very much. Um, and very nice to meet you recently um, um, electronically. But the, the, uh, Peter, Peter was uh, instrumental in the early CIPRI study on the CSE process of, uh, as applied to the Middle East. So really grateful for that work. The, um, uh, so, so we need to draw examples from everywhere and experiences from everywhere. And CEC is certainly not the only one. Um, so ASEAN, I, I have not looked at it yet, and I, I, will, I plan to do it and other experiences as well. Uh, and I'll draw on the existing literature on that. The, um, I, I want to make one thing clear, though, which is that um, there's a talk of, of a architecture in the Middle East and the absence thereof. Um, and there is talk about a process and a dialogue. And I would love to see a security architecture, but I think it's premature. Um, I think we are not even at the, talk, at the stage of talking. Let us talk about a process and see how we can kickstart that. And then um, with, with certain uh, manageable goals, 
um, but, but, but the main objective of, of which would be just to have the dialogue in order to open channels of communication, because that in itself can reduce the tensions that exist. And then if that works, then we can start talking about two things. One is to open it up to other countries in the region, because we can talk about the entire Middle East, of course. That will have problems, as you can imagine. And to talk about what would the security architecture look like. But I think for now, it is really premature. But if we don't have an end goal in mind, also that would be wrong. So it's good to think about it without focusing too much on the structure and uh, at the expense of the process. Great. Unfortunately, we're out of time. There are a lot of uh, excellent questions that remain unanswered. Um, uh, hopefully in the next sessions, uh, what next webinars that Crisis Group would organize. I want to thank Megan, uh, Wes and Joost for uh, sharing their insights with us. Uh, and thank you everyone for uh, joining this first webinar of Crisis Group. We can send a recording of the event uh, to any participant who would like to have one. Uh, I wish you all a great week and please stay safe. Thanks, everyone.